Hey everybody, Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. You ready for part two of the history of Judas Priest? Got Chris Allo here with me. How's everybody doing? We left off part one with Defenders of the Faith. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to start this part two with the next kind of phase in Judas Priest's career with the album Turbo, which came out in, uh, what, April of 1986? April of uh, 1986 is the, uh, the release for Turbo. So as we're looking at, uh, you know mid 80s here obviously a lot of the kind of 80s music influences a lot of synthesizers and you know commercial sounds creeping into the music of Judas Priest uh to some fans not a good thing right to newer listeners this some stuff is great it. right yeah. you know myself I was pretty on the fence with Turbo when it first came out yeah and I think, like, once, like, uh, kind of, like, extreme metal came and I started listening to a lot of thrash and, you know, then death metal and black metal, what have you, I really disliked this album a lot. However, as Chris and I were just talking off camera, I think time has been a little better to this record. Yes. Uh, and it's actually, even though it's a pretty cheesy album, there's still some fun tunes on here, some good rockers. And I think a lot of people... You go to see Priest live and they play, especially the title track. People totally, are yeah, it. people totally love it. It's totally it's, love it. it's, yeah. a, it's amazing. Um, yeah, I, when I when it first came out, I, I think I liked it, and then afterwards, yep, just like, exactly like you said, Pete. You know, your your influences on other stuff. Then I was like, I hated it. Yeah. Um, but in in revisiting it in in recent years, not awful. It's exactly like you said. It's 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 a fun record. It is. You know, Out in the Cold is good. Locked In's pretty good. Um, Reckless is a good one. Reckless is a good one. Yeah, some of the other stuff is a little... Yeah. yeah. But not terrible. I think holds up better than we initially thought. Uh, you know, I don't listen to it a hell of a lot, but um, I know when I do play it occasionally, I'm kind of like, yeah. Yeah, I've warmed up to a bit in the it, in, exactly. in yeah, it's, years. Maybe because I'm older, I don't know, but... Uh, no, it's true. Yeah. But overall, it's definitely a, a lighter tone than the, than the previous two records. It sold pretty well, though. It did. It was a hit for them. Uh, from from interviewing uh, the guys multiple times, uh, Priest as a band loves this record, uh, particularly KK and and Ian and um, and Glenn Tipton because it brought girls for the first time yeah. into the audience. Um, well, because yeah. they kind of, in a weird way, as much as Priest could, tapped into and I almost hate the term, but the whole hair metal scene. Totally right. I mean, they they changed the look kinda, of the band. You kind of had to it if you were a a, a metal band. Right. You kind of had to at the time. I mean, granted, there were bands like, you know, like Metallica and Slayer and Motorhead who didn't really give a crap about all that. Right. But I think most of the other, like, regular metal bands kind of had to go that route somewhat. Well, yeah. I mean, 1986 really was the crossroads because, like you said, you know, Thrash was was taking over the youth. So, yeah. you know, Maiden and, and Priest and Ozzy and Dio. Whitesnake. Well, they bit. all were at the crossroads. And it was either we go heavier or we go with the the lighter, softer tone with the big hair and the costumes, and everybody made that turn. Yeah, they did. Uh, Priest possibly made the biggest turn because they kept wearing the leather, but now they had the big leather trench coats, which was in at the time. The teased you know, hair. The teased hair. Halford, Halford grew his hair out. Uh, they had a lot more color. It wasn't just straight black leather yeah. now they had like yellow belts and red pouches and and whatever else and um it worked it, it sold it did. It did. people embraced it like it or not and um it, and it, i saw this tour it was a pretty fun tour that that was the tour i mean i was i was 15 i begged my uh my 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 dad to take me and yeah i hadn't gone to any concerts yet and so, unfortunately, I did not see them until the next tour. But the tour was very successful. First leg um, Dockin'. was Dockin. Yeah. Second leg, they finished um, out here with Crocus. Crocus. God. I think uh, it was like June. They did the New York. They did the Meadowlands and Nassau Coliseum. Yes. Yeah, so the and then at the show. end of the summer was with Crocus. And I want to say it was they came to Connecticut. I want to. I want to say. Yeah. Um, I'm a little rusty. Um, Reckless was the song that um, they were approached for the Top Gun soundtrack, and they the band wasn't quite sure. And uh, in, in the book, KK Downing uh, puts the blame on Bill Kerbishley, their manager, who turns it down 
But basically, the, all the guys in Priest loved the record as it was, and they loved the song Reckless, but they instantly regretted it because the Top Gun soundtrack was a huge, humongous The movie and, the movie and the soundtrack were enormous. Enormous. Yeah. Enormous yeah. that year. Um, the other thing, Not a good choice. No, no. Big mistake, and uh, we'll, we'll mention the repercussions on the next record. Um, but I was just talking to Pete about uh, Turbo was originally going to be a double record called Twin Turbos. And uh, they had this grand idea to do a, a double album of all new originals. And at some point, they decided to pale, uh, pare it down. And um, some of the songs that they probably had recorded, idea. probably a good idea, <laughs> were, were uh, jettisoned and then saved for uh, Ran It Down. They just recently did a, uh, uh, well, I guess it was a year or two ago, a reissue of Turbo. Um, and it was a, now it's a triple album with a, a double live but I was just saying to Pete, I think it was a huge mistake. They should have finally done the the twin turbos and put all the songs on there. Why not? Yeah. People would have bought it. Totally. I mean, you know, like the song Monsters of Rock from the next record uh, was was originally going to be on Turbo. And uh, there's a bunch of others, some of which have come out now on the, uh, the reissue series that they did. Um, but there's still a couple songs that never came out. Um, but a much lighter record, a lot of songs about partying. The song Parental Guidance was um, uh, as a result of the controversy from Eat Me Alive. Yeah. That was an anti-PMRC record, uh, anti-PMRC song. Uh, the band did not do any UK shows for uh, for Turbo. Again, just it's still concentrating, just concentrating on on, yeah. on uh, North America. Um, and it was working. I mean, well, they know where the money was at. That's so, it. Yeah, you really can't fault them too much, right? Yeah, huge, hugely successful. You know, like it or not, and um, but it, it's 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 aged kind of kind of okay, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, it's it's not it's not terrible. It was certified gold June tenth, nineteen eighty six, and platinum uh, July twenty fourth, nineteen eighty seven, which is again pretty uh, pretty fast. Yeah. yeah. I remember as a kid. Oh yeah, I put a note here. Uh, as a kid, this was the uh, I got the cassette when it came out. Uh, this was the first ever album that I ever got a cassette where it actually had credits for the solos. Yeah, because I never did that, right? Yeah. yeah Back yeah. then, the cassette tape, most of them had nothing. It was just a white inlay card. Yes. And, the, and uh, it always sucked because you know if you bought the record, nobody had, nobody was buying CDs yet. But if you bought the record, you got all the lyrics. You know, you buy the cassette, you had nothing. nothing yeah, they got to give you something, right? Yeah. They finally started to do credits, and I thought it was really interesting that Priest was the first band that I had ever seen where they gave you a breakdown of the guitar solos on each track. And I thought yeah. that was, I thought that was really interesting. And I think you know, over the years, probably most of us who have been following the band now can pretty much decipher who's playing what solos. Right. But I think back then. Uh, that would have been really cool to see on a fairly regular basis. Oh, totally! And uh, at the time was was when they recorded the uh, the little mini movie, Heavy Metal Parking Lot. Oh yeah, bunch yeah. of fans at the uh, I think it was in Baltimore. Um, it, was, it was like twenty minutes, and it's it's total. It's funny, and it's very much a uh, if you've never seen it, it's it's the kids at a Judas Priest docking concert, just drinking and partying and having carrying on in the parking talking, lot, having, yeah, having fun. Um, but it's truly one of those, you know, uh, what's the term, uh, you know, uh, uh, I can't think of the term, Pete, but it's, it's like a, like a, a, a snapshot, a snapshot, a, a snapshot of, of time, time. Yep, exactly, of, yeah. of what it was like in 1986 to be in, in a metal lot. shows. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, it's heavy metal park. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Every, everybody getting their hours in advance. I think almost anybody who's seen that, that film can remember back when they were young yeah. in in the eighties and going to see shows and you hang out outside totally. and yeah drinking and, and, beer in the yeah, boombox playing play boombox yep. playing the tunes that you're going to hear in an hour or two at the show but nobody cared yeah yeah it was definitely a good time again priest focuses on on America for their tour uh, four full months in um, in North America which is really un un unbelievable yeah. but that's yeah. like Pete said that that's where the money was they were they were they were a success so. They were keeping it going. Yeah. And that resulted in a live album, right? Yes. Uh, which is uh, Priest Live, which came out on May 28th, 1987. was recorded on uh, two dates on the, the Turbo Tour. Um, all of the songs were, were recorded um, on, on the Fuel for Life Tour, which uh, was the name that they give 
for the, for the Turbo Tour. Uh, this was I always thought this was interesting. None of the songs from the previous live record, Unleashed in the East, were repeated. So, you know, which no, is a good thing. I, yeah, mean, I, good I like thing. when bands you know put out live albums, especially like in more recent years. You have some bands who put out a lot of live albums. Right. You don't want to hear the same damn live album over and over and over again. So totally. I mean, a lot of bands are very conscious of kind of making sure that that doesn't happen. So yeah. that was a good guy. Used to have that on the same LP that Chris has. Uh, I used to have as now, well. I don't have this on CD. No, I, I brought this uh, because um, you know it's 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 a, it's a good record. My my beef with it is that it is the um, at the time um, you know when bands were coming out with live double records you know in the in the tradition of say Kiss you know the Kiss Alive records where you had like a um, pictures and all sorts of things there was for Priest Live I mean first off the album cover is fucking awful it is terrible I mean this where is the Judas Priest logo yeah. where is the band I mean. What it's what is awful. this? Yeah, it's pretty bad. A, a bunch of hands. <laughs> when when you open up the record, there's a airbrushed hands on a shot of the band of them. You know, you mean tell me they had nothing else that they could yeah, use? Like you couldn't use anything else. And then of course, you know, at the time, like Iron Maiden's Live After Death came with booklets oh, and yeah. and photos and everything. Look at this. This is like look at the other side. <laughs> It's like somebody Xerox this. Like that, that's it. It's not even in color. I mean, absolutely the worst packaging yeah. of, of any uh, heavy metal live I think, record. I think it hurt the sales a little bit. Oh too, no doubt. That was not a huge seller. For was them. not a huge seller. It, it did manage to go um, gold, but that's because it was a double record, and so, and we'll we'll talk about that later on. But when there's a double record, every sale counts as Less, two. Yeah. So now you only had to sell um, half the amount. To half the sale. amount to get uh, gold certification. There was a, uh, a VHS of this, which was released around the same time, uh, which was reissued many years later on the Judas Priest uh, Electric Eye DVD, and it was a, it was a big show. I mean, a lot of a lot of pyro, this big uh, robot monster thing. Um, they were going to tour in 1987 to promote the record. I don't know if they were going to just re. I would imagine they probably just would have reused the turbo stage setup. Probably, um, but for whatever reason, um, they decided not to, and uh, I guess they just pretty much took uh, took the year off. I don't think they did any shows at all in um, in 1987. Um, it's definitely um, it's a good record. Yeah. But in the grand scheme of things, not one that gets talked about a hell of a No, lot. no, definitely almost like a forgotten live album. Yeah, them, you know, and that could be because of. Um, you know, Turbo is not, um, you know, people think it's okay over the years, but it's not as held in as high regard as, yeah. say, British Steel or, or Screaming for Vengeance. Yep, exactly. So that leads to a little bit of interesting facts uh, that I had never heard before that Chris unearthed here um, called the pop songs. This is just prior to Ram It Down. Right. And this is fascinating stuff that I had never heard. And, uh, so Chris, I'll let you dive into this. Sure. It's pretty cool. So, um, at the time that they were working at the end of 1987, they were starting to work on the, the Ram It Down record. And Bill Kerbishley, who was, uh, Priest's manager, um, gave them the idea that they should work with, uh, a pop, some pop producers, for uh, for a couple days, the band had four days off um, around the holidays, and they went to Paris. Uh, and the names are um, Mike Stock, Matt Aiken, and Pete Waterman. And it was these 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 three pop producers who did uh, big hits for Banana Rama, Rick Astley, and and Kylie Minogue. Big names at the time. Big names at the time in, in the pop world. And Priest recorded three tracks with them, uh, two originals, which were, were written by them. One was called Run Around, and another one called I Will Return. And they also recorded a cover of the song You Are Everything, which I think was by the Stylistics, I want to say. I'm not a, I'm not a pop so, guy, so I'm not sure. But um, apparently they recorded these songs as a, somewhat of an experiment, just to see uh, what it was like. And they locked them away in the vault, never to be heard of again. And um, not even much of a mention. I mean, no, I've, I've never heard this before. That's like, but it's fascinating. Yeah, 
they went back to uh, recording their next record, and it was pretty much forgotten about. And maybe a year or two years ago, a, a short clip of You Are Everything was released on YouTube. And I don't know who put it out, because uh, apparently the only people that have copies are Priest and these, these three producers. Um, but I gotta say, I, I listened to the, the clip, I thought it was awesome. I mean, Halford sounds incredible, but at the same time, it was absolutely not the thing to do to, to release this. Thankfully, cooler heads prevailed, and they did not, because th this could have been disastrous. you got to wonder why whoever leaked the snippet, right? why do that if there's not, not going to be an intention of fully releasing, releasing everything? Right? Absolutely. You know? Maybe the producers did it to say, hey, listen. You know, it's 30 years later. We this still, happens. We still have this. This is all you're going to get, you know, but, but it happened, just so you know. But if some record company wants to come in and, and, and buy us some money, out, right, we'll do it. Release an EP with yeah. those songs, right? But it's... it's Priest it's, fans would buy it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I always scoffed at it, but then when I heard, you know, it, it did sound really good. But, um, yeah, thankfully, uh, it could have it could have killed their career right there. Yeah. And KK, KK Downing talks about it in the book that it was, yeah, it was not a good idea. To, uh, to release that. So it just sat in the vault, and uh, they had fun. And uh, I think Rob, I think it said in the KK book, I think that Rob Halford um, convinced the rest of the guys that uh, that they should do this. Um, <laughs> but yeah, hope maybe one day we'll actually hear we'll see. hear all, all three songs. We'll see. Fascinating bit of trivia yeah. there, right? So from there, they went back to work on their next studio record, uh, which was Ram It Down. Released May 17th, 1988. Probably, in the eyes of many Priest fans, one of their couple mediocre album releases. Yes, yeah. I, you know, in fact, I think at the time when this came out, I, I didn't buy this. I never owned this on LP. I didn't buy this. Oh, no kidding. So no, you didn't buy it back then. I didn't then. even buy it back then. Um, I bought this many, many years later, and I just, at the time... I was getting into much heavier music, and this just did not interest me at all. Gotcha. And especially what scared me away was to hear the cover of Johnny B. Good, ah, yeah, which that was probably, in, in the words of a, a friend of ours, Mr. Ryan Scout, probably the single worst thing they ever committed to. Him. That was that was a terrible idea. But again, the, the idea for them doing Johnny B. Good, of course, was they passed up on Reckless, and that was a huge mistake. So they were probably willing to jump in bed with any movie producer that came along so the Johnny B. Good producers, which was a movie with Anthony Michael Hall, uh, came around and they said, "Yeah, sure, we'll do a Johnny B. Good cover." And sure. it's absolutely because the it's, movie's going to sell gangbusters yeah. and whatever. And worked for Top Gun, and yeah, yeah the, the album sucked. The uh, yeah, just terrible, terrible movie. It went nowhere, and it's a it's a it's a lousy record. But at the time, it was heralded as the return of heavy metal for Judas Priest. You know, they had the fast song, Ram It Down, that opened it up. The title track is really good. I mean, the next song was called Heavy Metal. Heavy Metal. Then I know there's another song called Hard As Iron. <laughs> so, like, in the press, people were like, oh, Priest is back. If you hated Turbo, you'll love Ram It Down. Um, and at the time, I bought into it. Uh, I saw them twice on this tour. I was uh, 16, so I was thrilled to finally be able to see Priest. Uh, what I loved about this era... Uh, was just that, uh, while I, I wasn't in love with the record, I was thrilled that Priest sort of took a step back as far as the look. They went back to the more traditional black leather. Um, in the set list, they brought back songs like Sinner and Ripper and Victim of Changes Classics, yeah. that they had sort of let go by the wayside for uh, for some of the, the yeah, Turbo. Yeah, because at the time they were mostly playing British Steel, Scooter of Vengeance, Defenders, right. and Turbo stuff. Yeah. That was mo other than a couple other old favorites from the 70s. That, right. that was it. So so that's what I, what I, my fondness is really for the tour. And I was, as a kid, I was really bummed. We got Cinderella as the opening act, but on the West Coast, they got Slayer. Yeah, go uh, figure. I, I mean, that's crazy. Um, but, um, yeah, it did go gold in July of 1988, and, um... Ironically enough, I went to see them on this tour, I saw them with Cinderella, but I did not buy the album. That, that, that it's is kind interesting. kind of strange, right? Yeah. Yep. Didn't care enough about um, it, Um, uh, the album was mostly done with a drum machine. Yeah. 
Um, you can tell. Yeah, you totally could tell. And in the book, um, I was actually at the show. I, I didn't realize, of course, nobody knew, but I always assumed that um, Dave Holland, the drummer, was let go from Judas Priest. But apparently, um, at the Nassau Coliseum show on this tour, uh, Dave Holland went backstage and was yelling at Glenn Tipton for his lousy playing that night, and he quit that night. Really? He wow. said he, this is again, this is according to the K.K. Downing book, he said he would finish the rest of the tour, but he was he was done. Hmm. Which um, I, I thought was... Uh, was fascinating because I always thought um, I always thought that he was let go. Yeah, that's what um, I thought too. I always liked the song "Blood Red Skies" and I, too. Yeah, the vocal performance on that is just ear piercing. I mean, Halford is just shrieking at the top of his lungs, and it, it sounds great. Um, but there should have been it does, but the, it sounds almost um, almost industrial with those that drum machine. Um, but yeah, overall, as as a as a record, not not great. You know what it is? It came down to the songwriting. I just don't think the songs are that good. I mean, yeah. you know they tried to beef things up a little bit, make them sound a little heavier. Uh, but the 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 majority of the songs on here just aren't overly memorable. You know, the drum machine doesn't help, and you know the terrible cover notwithstanding. So it's just it's a it's a album with a couple good tracks, but overall kind of forgettable. Yeah, I actually don't. I bought the cassette back then, but Pete's got the. Uh, the, the remastered CD, which I actually don't have. I have to I have to buy one because when I went through my collection, I'm like, wow, look at that. I never you don't have Ram it I never bought Ram It Down. Not that I'll probably ever listen to it, but <laughs> I uh, just got to have it. Um, <laughs> apparently, they rec I didn't know this. They recorded a uh, Play With Fire from the Rolling Stones, um, but they it did, didn't make the album, obviously, because they did. Uh, Johnny be, be good, good. but um, maybe been better to do the other. Probably, say, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Johnny be good really is 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 terrible. That yes. was not a not not a good idea for them. No, no. So you know the '90s are creeping in, and obviously a lot of changes happening in music at the time and popular music. You know, grunge is right around the corner, pretty much. Uh, thrash is huge. Oh, in the 90s. has a stronghold on, yeah. on on American youth and, and European youth as well, but yeah. really in the states. You know, Anthrax, Megadeth, Slayer, Metallica—they're Metallica, all, yeah. all, yeah, all, all doing well. Yeah, Overkill, Exodus—I yeah. mean, all, all these bands are doing. You know, bands like King Diamond are selling you know yeah. thousands and thousands of records. And the hair metal scene is starting to dwindle a little bit. So yeah, you know, Motley Crue and Poison and Rat and all those bands are you know starting to slip as far as sales go. And you know, once grunge came along, that that shit was dead. So you know, Priest had to kind of do something here, right? And, uh, you know, like we said, with Thrash being so popular, I think Priest was like, you know, we got to do, like, drastically heavier material. And then this thing came out. Right. And I think most people were like, holy cow, we didn't think Priest could get that heavy. Absolutely. I mean, this is a pretty, this is a barn burner of an album. Great record. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe not the best album in Priest's catalog, but I think an album that completely revitalized them and you know, opened up or reintroduced their music to that younger core of people who were really getting into yeah. heavier, more extreme music. And this was probably the most extreme Judas Priest album at the time. I mean, this this made Screaming for Vengeance sound kind of light. Oh, yeah. This was the right album at the, at right, the right time. time. Yeah. Uh, released September 3rd, 1990. Um, they were actually recorded it in, um, in the winter of 1990, but the whole record got pushed back because we, we should mention that they had the um, the lawsuit uh, was what Vance and Belknap were two teenagers who listened to uh, was it stained class like a hundred times in a row yeah. and then uh, had a shotgun and they they shot themselves in the face uh, one one of them died uh, one of them lived um, horribly disfigured for a few years uh, there's a, there's a, a documentary on it called uh, Dreamer Deceivers which you should definitely watch if you're a Priest fan. Very sad and depressing story. Yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, Priest, um, you know, really had nothing to do with it. But they were in the lawsuit. They had to yeah. go uh, defend themselves, and things could have gone horribly wrong. I mean, Priest could have wound up in some American jail because they were because they wrote a couple tunes. That yeah, these because kids, they wrote a couple songs yeah. that these kids wound up uh, killing themselves over. But the whole record got delayed. Until the um, the lawsuit was was cleared, I remember when this record was coming out, 
there was a few ads early on where it said like Judas Priest and it was some, something along the lines of where it was like heavy as hell backwards and forwards because <laughs> they were Priest was being accused of backward masking. Why go there? Yeah. But it's... yeah, thankfully they, mm-hmm. they they quickly pulled those ads. But uh, great record. Uh, yeah, I, lo- I love the drummer record. too. Yeah, before yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Scott Travis. Scott Travis, which right, the first thing you hear on on here is uh, him blasting Scott away, Travis right? from Racer X blasting yeah. away on the drums. Um, the songwriting was definitely there. The production was there. This was the first time that they worked with uh, uh, Chris Sangrides instead of uh, Tom Allen since um, Unleashed in the East. Yeah. Chris had worked with Thin Lizzy and yes. many other artists. And he worked uh, on the Sad Wings of Destiny album. I think he was an engineer, I think he was an engineer yeah. on that record. Um, but uh, great record. I love this record. It definitely you know, reinvigorated Priest at the time. They started touring with heavier bands. They toured on the European tour. They toured with Pantera and Annihilator. Yeah. And then on the first leg yeah, of the like U.S. Testament. tour, Testament and Megadeth. Megadeth, yeah. I saw which that again, at, yep. Uh, I saw that, uh, I think it was at the Meadowlands is the one I saw. Um, but yeah, at the time, you know, there was not many uh, thrash bands that were taking being taken out at the arena level. Yeah. So yeah. It, that was a big thing. And those were the two hot bands at the time, you know, two of the hotter bands at the time right then. Um, and yeah, it definitely brought them back to the, to the top of the game. I, I know in the K.K. Downing book, I found it fascinating where he talks about um, Pantera opening for Priest on the European tour, and he didn't like it. He did. He did not like it. Wow. Um, he felt that a band like Pantera should not be opening for a band like Priest. Hmm. And he, he uh, also gave an example uh, around the same time, a couple of years later, he went to go see um, Ozzy Osbourne in concert, and Fear Factory was opening up. And again, he said kind that... Kind of a similar situation. Similar situation, and he was like, you know, Fear Factory should not have been opening for Ozzy, yeah. and I was like, "Wow, that!" I thought that was um, that was really interesting that yeah. he had that kind um, of strange viewpoint. Kind yeah. of a strange viewpoint. I'm not quite sure where he's coming from, yeah. but like, that's his I mean, opinion. These were up and coming metal bands, right? So it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And KK did write an "I Quit" letter at the end of the Painkiller tour, and apparently he um, he did not turn it in. Uh, there was a lot of turmoil, apparently, between him himself and uh, Glenn Tipton. He actually said in the book, and I, and I hate to keep bringing it up, but um, he actually said that he has hated Glenn Tipton and Jane Andrews, uh, who was the, the uh, manager or the, the day-to-day manager of Judas Priest uh, since 1985. That's a long uh, time. Which is a long, long time. Um, but as we know... Uh, Rob Halford decides to give his notice at the end of the the painkiller cycle and and leave the band. Interestingly enough, so it's KK the one who originally was thinking of right. leaving, and then Rob all of a sudden. Kind of strange too, because this was a time where Priest was all of a sudden they were back. Yeah, right. You know the, the album sold well, and people they were playing big arenas, and then all of a sudden Rob decides time to go, and you have to wonder. Well, obviously, if you know the. And we'll touch a little bit on this at the end, you know, with Rob's solo career, uh, Halford and Fight. I mean, he was getting into some pretty heavy, almost industrial yes. type stuff. He was very influenced, too, by, by Pantera. I yeah. mean, his whole uh, fight shtick, to me, just looked like the, the sound and the look. He was trying to ape Pantera, and he wanted to do a, a solo project, and he, uh, the record company would, would not... Uh, support it. Yeah. I guess at the time you couldn't be in more than one band at once, so um, that's why that's why he left Priest. Yeah, and, big and blow. Bi- yeah, <clears throat> big big blow for the band. KK was very upset at the Operation Rock and Roll tour. Um, he did not want to do that tour, and uh, apparently, according to him, um, Glenn Tipton was the one who called all the shots as far as what tours they were going to do. And he claimed Driving more of a wedge there between yep. those two, right? He he claimed that Glenn was the one that get, gave the yes or no, and the Operation Rock and Roll tour on paper. Now, I mean, even back then, it was a great lineup. It was Judas Priest, Alice Cooper, Motorhead, Dangerous Toys, and Metal Church. Wow. But it was in um, the summer of 1991, and the tide was already starting to turn, 
and ticket sales were were sluggish, and they had some canceled shows. And at the end, um, famously, Rob, at the very last night of the tour, Rob Halford was on the Harley, and um, I believe it was in Canada, I want to say. And when he came up on stage, he wound up uh, hitting his face and getting knocked off the motorcycle. Ouch. And I think they had to play Hellbent for Leather as as an instrumental. Uh, and yeah, that was... He was probably thinking, that's it. Yeah. That's it. That, 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 that was a sign from above, right? That was the, the tipping point. Yeah. And uh, yeah, eventually he, uh, he left and they tried to keep it quiet for some time, but... Um, Eventually, news did came out. Yeah. News did yeah. get out, and then, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this ties into uh, Black Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath in 1992 was on the road with Dio for the Dehumanizer tour. Um, Dio refused to do the last two shows in California because he didn't want to go on before Ozzy. Correct. So Rob Halford steps in. Uh, Halford does the two sets. Both nights with uh, fronting Black Sabbath, uh, and um, he did announce that night that he would return to Judas Priest, but it did not happen. Yep. Um, and there was no Judas Priest to speak of for quite a few years. Yep. Yep. Until a young guy by the name of Tim yep. Ripper Tim Ripper Owens, Owens stepped in after how, how many auditions did they have? Jeez, I don't even know. Yeah. Uh, I know. Addition, oh, like Ralph Sheepers from Primal Fear was under consideration, yes. and um, that might have been interesting. But I, I, you know, I, Tim Ripper Owens, a great singer, I think, and probably one of the best choices. Oh yeah. Um, but I think, and we're going to talk a little bit about the albums. I think that uh, losing someone like Rob Halford, not just from a vocal perspective, but from a songwriting perspective, really hurt this band. Absolutely. I mean, I guess we, we probably should have mentioned that. Uh, you know the uh, the Tipton Downing Halford uh, songwriting team. I think every every song um, from British Steel forward was credited to that that team. And I know several times in interviews uh, that I would I would tell them that to me that was you know that's the, the Lennon McCartney of, of heavy metal. metal yeah, yeah. You know those those three guys. They you know they had uh, you know they worked magic. And you're absolutely right. Without Without Halford, that was a, a crucial piece, and uh, I, I have it here in my notes. K.K. Uh, Downing said that part of the reason uh, that Jugulator, which is the first record with um, uh, with Tim Ripper Owens, part of the reason why it took so long uh, for it to come out was that Glenn Tipton was busy with his quote unquote solo shit. <laughs> that is that is a quote solo from K.K. Downing. Uh, once he was eventually dropped by Warner Brothers Records as a solo artist, that's when Glenn he was ready to go. With that's that. when he was ready to get back yeah. with Judas Priest. You know, regardless of what you think of Glenn's solo stuff, um, obviously, no, very few people bought it. Yeah, right, any of them. Right, and again, I, I was thinking about this earlier today. You know, you have to put it in perspective. Heavy metal was a bad word in the '90s. Yeah. I, have, I have a friend Eric who likes to term the '90s as the Great Metal Famine. It's um, absolutely. I gave up on it for a while because I, I just couldn't get into the whole grunge scene. And granted, that was you know a form of hard rock, right. obviously, but just different. And I I turned to other things in the '90s because just metal was just like yeah, it was you know you had the underground and yeah. the bands that were you know the the top peak bands the you know, uh, Dio and Maiden and, and Priest these bands that were doing arenas were now. Down to clubs, yeah, and they were getting no airplay, no no video play on MTV. Uh, it was it was a, a terrible time. Yeah, so you know, and you bring up Maiden, who were in a very similar situation. To, yeah, Dickinson gone, and having to bring in another vocalist, and all of a sudden things just weren't the same. Things were not the same. Yeah. Not the same. So it's interesting how they both parallel each other a little bit there. So Jugulator, what ninety seven? So again, October sixteenth, nineteen ninety seven. That's, that's a good bunch of years. So that's right? seven years yeah. with no Judas Priest. Um, recorded output, yeah. Albums or, or you know tours. Yeah. You know the last Priest tour was ninety one for Painkiller. Yeah. So six years is a long time to, to wait. And yeah, you definitely fans uh, forget about you. After yeah, a while, yeah. Totally, because they moved on to Pearl Jam and uh, Nirvana and Alice in Chains, uh, right. And the other spectrum was uh, Morbid Angel and Cradle of Filth. And 
death and, and death. Yeah, so obituary and yeah. All that stuff, yeah. So it was it was definitely a different time. Uh, I have the uh, the CD here. Let me grab that. I actually don't own either of the Ripper Owens fronted albums. <laughs> Look at that album cover. Huh? So this is uh, <laughs> 1997's yep. Jugulator. CMC, um, right? It's a little fledgling yep, label, C- CMC. CMC right? Records. Um, it was definitely, uh, it was a heavy record. Yeah, it was pretty heavy. Um, you know, it's a, it's a long record. It's almost, almost 60 minutes long. Uh, you know, the, the guitars were down tuned. They are, were definitely going for a... They were trying to be hip. I yeah. Think. They were trying to be hip, going for a more... Uh, 90s sound really again new metal was just happening at that time that, and that's right? a great point too I totally, totally forgot about that you yeah. know Corn and Limp Biscuit were ruling the world yeah so um, yeah tr- again trying to fit in yeah so again here we have Priest again trying to fit in to changing times yeah and nobody bought it yeah uh, KK said that um, he he uh, was steering the ship for the most part uh, Glenn didn't write a lot of stuff and um, it did not do well. I saw that. It, I mean, it, it did okay, I guess. I saw them the first leg of this tour at the Chance in Poughkeepsie. I just think about that. Right. This is which a place is, that the, I don't even think holds a thousand, right? Right. Yeah, I think it's 800 people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they sold it out. But on the Painkiller Tour, they were doing 20,000 20, seaters. Seaters, yeah. And now they're doing an, an 800 seater. Um, yeah, I don't remember who opened. But I loved it because. For six years, you could not see Judas Priest, yeah. and there was no, uh, there was very little activity from Rob Halford, which we'll, we'll talk about later. So to be able to see, you know, four fifths of Judas Priest, and to see them do, you know, um, Living After Midnight and Breaking the Law and all the the Judas Priest classics um, with the new guy who sounded good, He's got a great voice. He's got a great voice. I mean, he, he's not Rob Halford, but. No. Who is? You know, there isn't a, a Rob Alford out there. So yeah. I thought I thought it was um, it was what it was at, at the time. You know, it's um, I always think of that song. Uh, I don't even know who does it because it's not my not my style of music. But uh, when you can't be with the one you love, love the one, love you're, the with. one you're with. Still yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> you know, I knew Pete. Would know. He knows all all this music stuff. So yeah, Stephen you know, Stills. right? Yeah, you you had a had a love ripper at the time because that was the only Judas Priest you had and. So that was that was it. Yeah, they made the best they could. Right? Made the, did the best they could. They did a uh, once the tour was over, they did a um, a double live record, uh, which came out in 1998, and this is Judas Priest '98 Live, uh, which I don't even. I'm sure it's it's probably out of print again. This was yeah. CMC Records, but it's got uh, Beyond the Realms of Death. Uh, yeah, the set rapid fire, was pretty good. They did. They 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 pulled out. Thankfully, with um, with Ripper, they did pull out a couple songs that they hadn't hadn't normally done. I remember them doing uh, Devil's Child on on one of the runs. Uh, I know I, I saw them uh, twice technically on the Jugulator tour. First was the Chance, and then uh, Ham- the Hammerstein Ballroom. I think was the next time. So that was That's a, a, a step up. Yeah, that was yeah. a bigger place. That was a couple thousand people. That was uh, 19, 1998, I guess. Uh, but yeah, Juggalator didn't do what, what they were hoping for. Um, but, you know, nobody was really doing great business as far as the metal world in in 1997. No, I'm not even your Metallica's and Megadeth's were really yeah. making a lot of money with anything. So yeah. yeah, Slayer was back to clubs. Motorhead yeah. was back to clubs. Yeah. I mean, I remember that year... Going to see Motorhead and Wasp co-headlining at Irving Plaza. I mean, because yeah. it was things were so bad. I mean, a couple of years earlier, you know, they were selling that place out indiv- individually. Yeah, yeah. You know, they had to put band like packages like Dio and Motorhead together to fill one club. Yeah. So it was it was yeah, the, great, the stock on all these yeah. bands had really fallen quite a bit. Yeah, it was it was a terrible time to be a, uh, a heavy metal band, but. Um, you know, it was uh, continue on because there was nothing else you could do. Yeah, yeah. So demolitions next. Yes, um, final album with Tim Ripper Owens. Yep, uh, this is the European digipack of demolition. Um, this one has um, two bonus tracks of uh, re-recordings of Rapid Fire and Green Monolishi. 
with uh, with Ripper on on them. And these were also on the Japanese only EP of uh, Bullet Train. Um, and uh, yeah, Demolition is a fucking awful album. <laughs> it is it is unbelievable how bad it is. Um, let me see how many songs are on here. I don't, not, think, I, not, I don't think I've heard more than a couple tracks. Not including the, 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 the it's 78 minutes and 43 seconds. Way too long. First Way time. too long. There is 13 original tracks, and I'm just looking at the times. There's one, two, three, four songs that are over six minutes. Yeah, one, two, three. yeah four of them are over six minutes long a piece. I mean, this is That's crazy. It's a half hour right there. Yeah, so. yeah, and and this, it's just it's it's shit. It, you know. It, I saw them twice on the Demolition Tour, again, because I enjoyed seeing somebody play Judas Priest songs, yeah. and the band was good live, but the Demolition record sucks. Yeah. K.K. Downing says that, uh, mentions in the book that uh, he left the writing up to Glenn, and that's why the record sucks. <laughs> um, and it's just, it's a, sh it's a shit record. He also throws Glenn under the bus. Because he said Glenn Tipton produced the record. But the, the caveat was Glenn would produce the record at his home studio, but he made Judas Priest foot the bill to buy all new studio equipment in his studio so that he could do it. Um, so no love lost between these two guys. No, no. These guys really don't like each other. Uh, apparently, uh, the idea on this record was to do a more traditional sounding Priest record that was a bit more melodic after the down-tuned uh, jugulator, but uh, it's just, it's garbage. It's, 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 it's terrible. Um, so the band at this point are just like, kind of like, what do we, what do we got to do here? Yeah, because, they I mean, are. It's not working. I mean, do we yeah. just, this, do we just give it up or do we try and get our man back? Yep. Right? And what happens, and I didn't, I did not know this again, I, I hate to keep bringing it up. Um, but until I read the uh, the K.K. Downing book, he said that, believe it or not, Sharon Osbourne was the one that um, was uh, instrumental in them getting Rob Halford back. Because apparently she's the one that reached out to Priest in 2002. And she said, hey, why don't you get Rob Halford back and we'll put you on as one of the main stage bands Ozfest. for Ozfest 2003. Well, of course, she's looking at it for her own best interest. Of course. There, right? you know. um, it didn't happen, though, for another year. So they didn't wind up talking to Rob until 2003, and so the reunion didn't actually happen until Ozfest 2004. Right. Um, yeah, because I remember he was still doing the, I think it was the Halford Band. Yes, at when, that time. When, when Maiden got back with Bruce yep. on that big tour. And I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get to that later on, yeah. but he had to reinvent him. It, the timing was perfect because Priest was faltering, and Halford did two very well-received solo records and sort of reinvented himself again as the metal god yeah. and was quickly accepted by, by people again. So, um... It, it, the timing was was definitely right. So, she, yeah, Sharon was looking out for herself, oh, but it was very interesting. Oh, and the the uh, the demolition tour did produce another uh, double live record uh, with a terrible cover, Judas Priest live in London, uh, which I think There's you have another version. Yeah, yeah. They also did a live um, it's a DVD, a live right. DVD, I'm which over here somewhere. Yep, yeah, that's in there. There we go. Yeah, there it is. And the, these are the, uh, that's the only live video recording with uh, Tim Ripper Owens. Um, and Tim Ripper Owens recently stated that he was going to re-record um, both albums because they have been out of print for so long, and he feels that his era of the band has been buried. Neglected, yeah. So he wants to, I don't know if he's going to re-record. Does, does he have nothing better to do? I, I, get, I mean, he's a busy guy. Yeah. So I don't know why, and maybe if you want to do a couple of songs off Jugulator, because there's a couple of good songs like Cathedral Spires and a few others, uh, Brain Dead, but man, Demolition is just shit. <laughs> just steer clear of that record, uh, because it's just it's just terrible. <laughs> so Tim, if you're listening, don't, don't bother with Demolition. Sorry, Tim. It's, yeah. it's, it's bad. Um, but yeah, so Halford, Halford comes back. And they do a, uh, a massive world tour 
of the U.S. and Europe uh, in 2004, and it's um, very successful. They quickly get in the studio and and bang out uh, Angel of Retribution, which comes out on March 1st, 2005. Good album. Very good record. Back on Epic. Yep. Uh, it was a, this was a big deal. Yeah. It was a big deal to have Rob back, and I mean, they... They um, they toured and they went right in the studio. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know they were touring. Uh, God, I want to say like uh, you know the end of the summer, and they went in the studio in October of that year and went right in to do the uh, do the record. And I listened to it again re- just recently. I was just listening to it today. And other than the last track, it's really good. It is good. I it's mean, a very good comeback. Record. Judas Rising, man, just oh, yeah. starts it with vengeance. And uh, just a lot of really good tunes on it. Demonizer is great. Deal with the Devil. Great song. I, I love uh, the ballad Worth Fighting For. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Yep. Yeah. Um, Hellrider's good. Yeah. It's just really, really strong, classic-sounding priest, though. Yeah. I, so even Revolution, even though it kind of sounds uh, like the, the riff reminds me of Mountain Song from uh, Jane's Addiction. I really like that song. It's, it's a really solid record. Even the ballad Angel. It's good. I, I like it. Yeah. The you know the one standout is the last track on the record, which Loch is Ness. Loch Ness, which, which is, is way too long. Which Probably is, if they would have condensed it, might have been better. But it yeah, was, it's kind of like a uh, harbinger of what was to come, I guess. You Thir- know? Thirteen and a half minutes of Rob yeah. Halford crooning about the Loch Ness monster. Yeah. And I think it's shit. I mean, I love Judas Priest. <laughs> and I love the Loch Ness Monster, like, folklore and all that kind right. of stuff. But yeah, it was a little, uh, that way song too is, much, right? It's, it's garbage. And it brings down an otherwise <laughs> really great strong record, really strong <laughs> record, produced by Roy Z, who at the time... Pretty hot producer. He was the yeah. hot metal producer. He'd just come off the string of records with, uh, with, Bruce, with Bruce Dickinson. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just um, a good sounding record. Roy Z actually was trying to mimic the guitar tones from uh, Sin After Sin and Stained Class. And um, I, I wouldn't quite say it sounds, no, but there, there's some, some similarities for sure. Yep, yep. But yeah, really good record. They were good um, on the tour too. Uh, yep. Yeah. The only thing I noticed on the tour is you could tell that there were a bunch of guys who hadn't played together in a while. Yeah. There seemed to be like everybody kind of was doing their own thing on stage and there wasn't a lot of the closeness that I think yes. we always... But again, now that we know what was going on between KK and Glenn. Yes. And then, you know, like for me, I remember seeing this tour and thinking, God, Halford hasn't moved from the spot he's in the entire show. He just kind of sat in that one position yeah. and didn't move. He had on glasses. And that big long he, coat. The big long coat and he was kind of hunched over. Yes. And there was a lot of stories about him reading the lyrics off the teleprompter. He was also apparently having a, a lot of problems with his back, back at the time. Yeah, yeah. So while I thought they sounded great, I, I agree. Um, I was a little disappointed at the um, their, their stage presentation. Just the yeah. way they were moving and their interaction with the one another. was kind of predictable, too. Yes. But. Yeah. Absolutely. It did. I tell you what, it didn't make me want to run out and see them again on the next tour, and especially after hearing the next album, I was kind of like, I'm not even going near there. Even though they were, they they did the whole right. Uh, well, we'll get to that. Yeah, in we'll a get. Second. We'll yeah, we'll definitely get to that. I mean, I still, I, I, I I'm you not probably sure. Went, right, I think you. Went well, yeah, to. I like. So let me see. I, I, I made notes. Um, so what? 2004. That oh, that was the reunion tour. So I'm three times on that tour. I saw them twice on the Angel of Retribution tour. I know one time was with Queensryche, Queensryche yeah, yeah. and what was really cool with that tour was they opened with Solar Angels. I remember that on that tour, and I saw them. I'm trying to think what was the other one on the Angel of Retribution tour. Hmm. I don't know. I'm a little. I'm a little rusty. Pete. Yeah, I, mean, I saw them with Queensryche. So. All right. So yeah, it was, oh, Anthrax. No, oh, so it was the Anthrax tour. They did one run with Queensryche. And they did, an, and I think I saw that at the, uh, that's the casino in Connecticut, um, Foxwoods or Mohegan okay. Sun. And then the second leg that had Anthrax opening, and that was the leg that they opened with Solar Angels. Gotcha. Okay. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, something different, um, right? Yeah, definitely something something different. You know, you always want to hear songs that you um, you don't hear all the time when yeah. you see you see. You know, I, when I did my list, uh, I've apparently seen Judas Priest twenty five times so far. Uh, with two more to come in 2019, just like yourself. 
So, of course, we're hoping to hear some songs that we haven't It'd heard. It'd be nice. Yeah, a million times already. It'd be nice. But, I see um, some, well, you know what? They they threw a couple surprises in on yes. both legs of the tour that we just saw. Yeah. Uh, it's like we both caught them twice. So you, did you see them three times on this last uh, tour? What was this last tour? I saw them three, three times. Three times. I saw yeah. them twice. And they played different set lists, both of them. They did, so yeah. I'm hoping on this leg of the tour coming up in 2019 with Uriah Heap, they throw a couple other new ones in. So we'll see. We'll see. Definitely. And uh, so the next the next album um, is released on... Now, there were some delays. This album was originally going to come out in late 2006. Then for some reason, it gets pushed to 2007. And it finally drops on June 16th, 2008. And probably, it probably is... Should, probably should have held off even more. It is Nostradamus. Yes. I got to tell you, I just... Cannot warm up to this album. I've tried. I've tried. It's fucking awful. <laughs> it is the worst. Listen, if Steve, if Steve Keeler's watching, I remember I had to go to, you know, when you interview bands, um, you know, they started this years ago. They make you go to the, if, if it's a big band, they make you go to the record company and they make you, they play you the record. Uh, in person, and then they immediately have you enter the in, interview the band. And I remember going to the city, and they put on the uh, Nostradamus for me, and I couldn't believe how it's a double disc concept oh album, right? And it's torturous. It is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I got through the first disc, and the PR person comes in. He's like, "What you think, right?" And I was like, "Holy shit, yeah!" <laughs> and I'm like, I lied through my teeth. It was fucking awful. <laughs> I remember talking to Steve Keeler on the way home. He was like, how is it? I was like, dude, it is, and I've said this before, the worst album in the history of heavy metal wow. is Judas Priest's Nostradamus. It's fucking awful. I don't know what they were thinking. Yeah. It's a it's a grand opera about uh, Nostradamus who could who could foretell the future. It apparently was Bill Kerbishley's idea, which was their manager. Now, he had success... With the Who on Tommy and Quadrophenia. A so, long time A long time ago. previously. K.K. Downing said in his book that he thought it was the best idea that Bill Kerbishley ever came up with. K.K. was completely behind this. The whole band was completely behind this. And um, at the time, they kept threatening to play the entire album from start to finish. People would have left um, in droves. You know, I remember in my head debating, going, as much as I love Priest, even if I get free tickets, and at the time, in 2008, you know, you could still get free tickets from oh, record yeah. companies. Yeah. I remember thinking, God, even if free, with free tickets... I don't know if I, I want to go. I don't know if I can go. I didn't. I because passed. other than the one time I had to hear the record um, at, the, at the, uh, the, uh, the record company, I have never been able to, to listen to the album from start to finish. It, it is garbage. It's horrible. And There's you know what? I think even if they would have reduced this to a single LP, yeah, it's still it shit. still would have been terrible. Absolutely. Because really, and, and I couldn't even tell you what songs they are because I haven't I haven't listened to this since probably right. a year after it came out because I, I tried like three four times. I'm like, oh yeah, I could. There are maybe two or three tracks that are pretty decent on here. I couldn't tell you what they are because I've just avoided it for so many years. Right. It's just like this just sits up on the shelf and there's that one song where Halford goes, I am Nostradamus. That yeah. that song's probably the best <laughs> and that's still shit. Yeah. Um I, I did see them five times on this tour because I'm a big priest fan, but also they toured with some great acts. I mean the 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 summer tour it was Judas Priest, Heaven and Hell, which was Black Sabbath with Ronnie James Dio, yeah. Motorhead and Testament. Yeah. I mean, that was a that was a fantastic lineup. I think I saw that one three times on, on its own. But um, yeah, the album is just it's just fucking it's garbage. garbage. Yeah, it's but garbage. yeah, the band kept threatening to want to play the album in full. And KK talks about it in his in his book that he thought it was a huge mistake that they didn't do that. Um, but it's it's. Yeah. Awful. Could you imagine if they did that? Ugh. I know they wanted to do like opera houses and like Radio City Music Hall, but it's such a terrible record. Yeah, you got if you got to have a good concept album that people yeah. are going to want to hear. This is nobody not nobody it. wants to hear this. I don't know if I've ever come across anybody who really loves this album. Well, that's what I was going to say. I don't know if you remember, but I remember reading on the internet, and if it's on the internet, it's got to be true. Yeah, of but course. there's a guy out in the Midwest who has the Guinness Book of World Records for listening to an album the most times. He listened to this album like 
don't know how many times a day for like a year. And I was like, are, is this guy on drugs? He must be. Like of all the Judas Priest albums to listen to on repeat, A, you pick the longest one and the worst one? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's awful. There's just nothing memorable on here. Nothing. Nothing yeah. at all. It's like, you know, you almost want to give them credit for doing something on this scope. But yeah, that's you gotta, about it. you got to back it up with songs that you want to hear again. And there's nothing on here you want to hear no. again. It, it is an opera. Yeah. It is an opera about a, a fortune teller, essentially. And there's all these little guitar bits and bobbles. It, it, it's garbage. Yeah. I, I think my the my copy might actually be sealed because it, it's, it's... You heard enough at the listening party, oh, right? God, it, was, it, was, it was terrible. I mean, there's... There's orchestrations and synthesizers and keyboards yeah. and choirs and it's uh it's, a, so it's once again album. they puzzled their fans. Yes, they 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 have definitely you know over their career made some very puzzling decisions. I wonder um, how much that album sold? Probably not much. Well, I, I'm I'm just looking to see if it um have some kind of certification in here. I remember pretty pretty much of a bomb. It 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 uh, it, uh, it doesn't say. Yeah, I mean, I think I guess it sold well enough for the band to continue to tour, but I guess not well enough for them to do that lousy idea of um, of playing the record live. Yeah. And again, you know, you wonder too. Okay, at the time, um, the the double records counted twice, so every sale counts. You know, so it's as inflated. Two. Whatever it sold, probably a little bit inflated. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So um, at this time. Um, Priest then does a, a tour in 2009 where they decide to celebrate British Steel. Got to do something to reinvigorate the fan base, yeah. right? Because everybody, I think, was turned off by that album. So And yeah. they, they go out and they play British Steel from start to finish. And um, I remember seeing that tour uh, just the one time. And Whitesnake um, either opened or co-headlined, however you want to... Uh, talk about it yeah. it was cool I, I loved it I, it was great because I love like uh, the Rage and Steeler and to finally see them playing these songs and I stayed away because of how much I hated the Nostradamus yeah. album uh, I, I don't think I don't know if they did any songs um, from Nostradamus probably not uh, and they did you, you have it right Pete the uh, the live record do, do I have it or do you have it the, uh, the live uh, there was a live DVD and CD recorded on the that tour as, as part of the re-release for uh, for British Steel, uh, yeah, the thirtieth anniversary yeah, because I got that. I got that the first. tour was two thousand nine, but the yeah, British right. Steel re oh there it is yep, the British Steel re release came out in um, May eleventh of twenty ten, so uh, thirty years later yep. as a uh, double or triple package, and um, that was pretty cool. Yeah, that was cool. I, I enjoyed it, and at this is where. Things really start to get weird because uh, Jane Andrews, who is the day-to-day -day manager for Judas Priest, uh, comes to K.K. Downing and she wanted him to write a five-track EP for whatever reason. And K.K. loses his shit <laughs> because he's like, we just did this massive Nostradamus double record. Why are we going to do this? Why are we, oh, yeah. we doing this? We didn't even properly do Nostradamus. Um, and yeah, that led him to um, eventually uh, leave the band. And he uh, it's getting up there in age. I mean, I think he's next to Glenn. I think the second oldest guy in the band, correct? Yes, but not not I much, so. right? You yeah, know? no, they're all they're all kind of kind of uh, you know similar in age. And he decides to to quit. And I don't have in front of me when exactly he decides to quit. But then the, uh, and it was apparently, uh, uh, at the time it was, um, I think he, he did two letters, if I remember right. The first letter was the nice letter, and then uh, he did a second letter, which was the scathing letter, where he said he basically burnt his, his bridges with, um, with the band. They decide to uh, announce a farewell tour, which is known as the Epitaph Tour. And I think that was documented on the... Is yeah. that the Battle Cry disc? Uh, I thought there was a separate epitaph. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe it's in there. Oh, there it is. Yep. So that was... 
It's actually pretty good. Yeah. So the so good 2000 2011 2012 was the Epitaph tour, and that was cool because Priest had decided they got a new guitarist, which was Richie Faulkner, yeah. who came from Lauren Harris's band, uh, which is the the daughter of uh, of Steve Harris, and he looks like a young KK Downing, and he's a really good guitar player. Really he, good guitar player. He fit in the band perfectly, and they do this tour where they traveled the world and they played at least one song off of every single Rob Halford fronted Judas Priest record. Yep. Um, and it was supposed to be a farewell tour, which is why the tour was called Epitaph. And then while they were touring, they were like, you know, uh, let's make another record. Maybe for the fans, yeah. like Kiss would say. <laughs> We should keep Originally it going. Originally, they said, we, we're probably going to retire from touring, but we'll yes. still make records, right? Because yeah. they were never going to tour again. Absolutely. So they right. yep. said. So they said. So, yeah, they actually, so of course, they did not stop touring, and then um, they started to work on the next record, which was 2014's Redeemer of Souls. Came out July 8th, 2014. Another very fine album. Very good record, produced by Mike Exeter and uh, Glenn Tipton. First record without uh, K.K. Downing. A really solid record. Um, the biggest complaint that I've heard from quite a few people is that the guitars were not uh, loud enough. Um, songs were there, though. I think the song songwriting was, there. was overall was definitely there. I thought, and, and this was a double one, Pete's got the, the double version yep. because it was released with um, one version had 13 songs, and then there was a bonus disc with five, five additional discs. songs. Uh, the problem is it was combined, it was 83 minutes and 39 seconds. Yeah, it was long. It so was like long. today, I, I went back and I listened to the, the bonus songs and eh, songs like Snake Bite. The and bonus tunes are not that good. Tears of Blood, Creatures, yeah. they're all kind of mediocre. Yeah, they're mediocre. But I think the the regular album is quite good. Yes. What I, what I find very interesting about this album is that I think it kind of draws on a lot of different eras of Priest's. Because there's a lot of different flavors on this album. And I also think there's a very strong like European power metal feel to a lot of these tunes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, see, what, which, I see that. you know, kind of new for the band, I think. So I think they were trying to become kind of hip to, you know, what was going on in the metal world at the time. But I think a pretty strong record. I mean, you know, Dragonaut is great. I, I love Halls of Valhalla. Sword of Democles is very good. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's um, um, Cold Blooded and Crossfire. All really strong tunes. I, I like this album a lot. I think uh, fans were kind of mixed. Some people really liked it. Some were kind of like, eh, you know. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think you absolutely nailed it, Pete. Again, from from uh, interviewing the band many times, you know, they're they're very concerned with well, there's a lot of different elements in Judas Priest. So you know, somebody that likes Turbo might not also like Painkiller. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's always been their concern that the band is so so varied. Uh, but yeah, they I go could, they go back to rock and roll sound on here yeah. on a couple tunes. I mean, it's it's all over the place stylistically, and maybe that's what a lot of fans didn't like. It's like I think some fans like a unified sound across yeah, the entire more Priest cohesive. record. Yeah, whereas this is not. I like it because I think it touches on a lot of the different Priest eras. So for me, I'm a big fan of this album. Yeah, I really liked it. Um, it hit number six on the Billboard Top 200 chart, um, which is really good, and it's yeah. uh, it says. Uh, Wikipedia says it sold 110,000 copies in the U.S. as which of February nowadays, 2016. Which, that's pretty good nowadays. That's yeah. really good nowadays. Again, the thing to keep in mind is it's a double record, so every double counts as two units sold. Yep. So again, you have to wonder because everybody, the Holy Trinity did it at the exact same time. Maiden, Priest, Sabbath. They all did double records at yep. the same time, they and, the, and they all got these double sales numbers in. Um, my, my only complaint, my biggest complaint with this record is, is it's too many songs. It's too much filler. I think the, the album on its own stands out great, but the, the five bonus cuts there, they're, they're, really they're fairly mediocre. Yeah. This was my number one release of the year of the year. Oh, for 2014. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's, um, it's, it's a good record on that. Let me see on that tour. Let's see. I, I caught them once in 2014 and... Once in 2015. Once was with Mastodon. And I can't remember the other one. I don't remember if I saw him on this tour. I don't think I did. 
Yeah, that was a good one. The uh, they, I remember uh, Halford almost kind of came out of his shell a little bit. A little bit, yeah. He stopped wearing the sunglasses. Um, you know, I I I, I hate to, to to say it, but I like the term "look me in the eyes when you're going to fuck me." So, like, I hate, I would hate how Halford would have these sunglasses on and be staring at the, the fucking stage at his feet yeah. or at a monitor, and he was not doing he that would, He would hold that mic and he would just... That's like, it. Right? That's, That's it. Doing. And, you know, if you look at old Priest videos, he was looking at the audience. Yeah. He, was, he was connected. And for this tour, um, he was back. He was back to his old self. I remember one of the two tours... Uh, I actually had tears in my eyes when he did Victim of Changes because he sounded so on. He he was he looked good. He was moving good. He wasn't wearing the stupid glasses. Um, and that was, uh, to me, really, they, they, they took a step forward or, or backwards, depending how you look at it, to, to where they once were, the, the yeah. greatness of Priest. And listen, if we had to lose K.K. Downing to get to that, I'm okay with it. Yeah, so be it. So, right? Sorry, K.K. Yeah. I still like the book. <laughs> So we fast forward a couple of years, right? So Priest is kind of riding another wave once again, a late career renaissance. Um, and they announce a new studio album called Firepower, which is this bad boy right here. Uh, but then we get a little bit of bad news that, um, you know, Glenn Tipton has got Parkinson's. Yes. He's had it for years. And he can no longer physically tour with the band anymore. The, the record came out March of 2018. Um, and actually, the tickets, I do remember this, um, the tickets went on sale, and there was a Before lot... Before they made the announcement, right? Yes. Yeah. And there was, the tickets, no, no, after. Wait, no, no, you're right, right before. Yeah. So, so the, the, the album's announced. I remember I heard the record, because again, I had to go to the city, listen to the record, and then interview the band. So I, I heard the record in, de in early December of 2018. They made me sign a contract saying that uh, I couldn't tell anybody oh and where's my where's where's my my thing oh here we go this was this was really this was one of my inter, one of my interviews with priest and um, I interviewed Rob Halford uh, Scott Travis and uh, Richie Faulkner and I thought it was so cool that the, the magazine I write for put my name on the cover almost almost as big as Judas Priest which is really crazy um, but um, yeah they made me sign these papers saying can't tell anybody can't talk about it on Facebook but then the tickets go on sale and then a couple weeks after tickets were on sale on February 12th of this year 2018 they announced that Glenn will not be touring and it was just like a lot of pissed off people a lot of pissed off people because they were like wait a second you mean I just spent all this money I spent on all this tickets. money Glenn Tipton's not even neither Glenn or KK is going to be there like what yeah this is like a priest tribute band what's going on here I mean, I'll, I'll be I'll be completely honest I bought tickets for three priest shows on that first leg of the tour and then I did wind up selling one set because the, the you know losing Glenn I was kind of bummed I was like, okay, well, maybe I only need to see them twice on this this first part. But the um, caveat was that they then announced that Glenn would show up at the specific dates to yes. play a couple tunes. So you never were sure where he was going to show up. Which was very smart on their part. Yeah. I mean, I, I happened to catch him on one of the two shows that I saw in, in Me too. New Jersey. Yep, uh, we're at the same show. And that was pretty cool. Uh, you would have thought that he would have been there for the Bethel, New York show, which is the old Woodstock yes. site. I, I was I was shocked that he did yeah, that. Yeah. V very much so. Yeah. But, um, but a great, a, a great really record. Really good album. Uh, that universally was acclaimed yeah. by Yeah, universally praised by, yeah. by everyone. G great production they got. Yeah. This was the... This was the uh, the Judas Priest dream team. They got Mike Exeter uh, to be the engineer who worked on uh, Redeemer of Souls. Yep. They got Andy Sneap... Um, who is the in-demand metal producer, produced everybody. everybody from uh, Exodus and Saxon and Cradle of Filth and, and you know, all these... Well, tons more. Uh, ton, yeah. Tons more bands. And they brought back Tom Allen, who, of course, produced all the Jews Priest hit albums. Uh, they got the three guys to work together and came up with a awesome-sounding Priest record. It's a really good album. And, you know, it's a long album. Again, a lot of songs on here, but... 
No duds. Really. No, not not really. I just think maybe one or two could have been trimmed off. Could have yeah. been trimmed off. Yeah. I do remember when I when I, I interviewed the guys. Rob was the one who was pushing. He only wanted ten songs on the record, um, but the other guys convinced him that uh, they should have more. And there there's other songs actually. I think didn't make it. Scott Travis told me that he recorded drum tracks, I think, for 24 songs. Ooh, and God. thank God they didn't put out that many. So they probably, it's so they've talked a lot since that they've got another album that they're probably going to yeah, do. So they've got more than enough material. They've got more than enough to, uh, to, to put something else together. Amazing sounding record. Um, they said that the songwriting process was, was very relaxed. I know they told me that this was the first album in years where they actually jammed as a band in, in the studio, you know, and recorded and rehearsed together. Whereas in, instead of everybody doing their own parts separately, and they they all really like that, and that's how they used to do it back in the day, and that's how they got so so many great songs out of it. So yeah, yeah. It, it certainly seems like it, it worked. Yeah, I like it. I, I mean, many a- many people have picked their as their number one record of the year. I know you. Re- it was my number two. Yeah, I was just going to say, I know for me, I think maybe I would, I, I think I would put Amorphous, uh, Queen of Time at number one, and I think I'd put Firepower at, at, at number two. I had the Immortal record as my number oh, one. This Immortal was number great, two, and I think record. my Amorphous was number five. Right. It really is. Yeah, it was a good year for metal. So, um, but yeah, I and they and they sounded great. Live. Absolutely, they were Andy great Sneap live. is now pay, playing second guitar with the band. Um, pretty good, you know. I guess. You could ask KK to come back, but I guess that bridge is burned. So Andy stepped in, did a fine job, I yeah. thought. And uh, I, I thought Halford sounded the best I've heard of in years on this tour. Sound, sounded phenomenal. Oh, man. Great set. We should talk to, since we're talking live, phenomenal set list. Yep. I mean, they pulled out songs. I mean, they played songs that they, they never played before. Um, they, you know, they played songs like Running Wild that they haven't done in... Uh, you know, uh, 30 years. Yeah. Um, so it was uh, Bloodstone. They hadn't played in, you know, 30 years. So yeah. not to mention the stained class stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was, it was a great set. Saints um, in Hell. I mean, God. Yeah, Saint, yeah. Saints in Hell had never been performed live yeah. uh, until uh, until this year. Uh, Just then think on, about that. Yeah. Which Why is crazy. was that decision ever yeah. made not to play that song live? And then the second leg, they brought out uh, Delivering the Goods, yeah, which, which again hasn't been done. Since, um, uh, I think, uh, British Steel. So, yeah. So, just the band is on, is on fire. And very interestingly, I read that something like Andy Sneap is not going to continue, um, I guess, maybe for next year. Maybe past next Beyond year. That. Beyond next year. So, um, I'm assuming that they're, that does that mean it. they're going to have it, they're going to get a new guitar player. Um, KK does talk in the book. That he felt he was, um, he would have come back. Uh, he felt almost, I guess, uh, slighted that he did not get the uh, the call to come back. But you know, if you read the book, uh, it's it's he's pretty adamant that uh, he hates Glenn Tipton and he hates Jane Andrews. And Jane does the day to day managing of the band. Every time so I've how interviewed, would that work? Yeah. right? Every time I've interviewed the band, Jane Andrews is there. So I there's I don't see how he could possibly have come back um, in that in that situation. Hmm. So um, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll see what happens because uh, Jews Priest have another a third U.S. leg lined up in May of 2019 with Uriah Heat. Yeah. So that's going to be uh, very interesting. And yeah, where Priest goes from there, anybody's guess it could be anybody's guess. Halford has mentioned a. Sort of hinted at a 50th anniversary tour, which is ironic because none of these guys were in the band in 1969. <laughs> but that's a whole other story. Um, so we'll see. I, I I predict they'll do another record. Yeah, I think so too. I think they'll do at I least think, one more album. I think they'll do another record. And do they attempt another farewell tour? Could be. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. So that's the history of Judas that's Priest. That's the history. I'm sure we I've, we forgot a ton of stuff. And yeah, you know, why don't we show some merch? Okay, sure. Uh, what do we got? Chris has got uh, these are Chris's here. I'm going to show these real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Some tour programs, the World Vengeance Tour. Okay, that's pretty neat. 
else we got here? How about from uh, the next tour? 1984, Defenders. We got uh, Painkiller. And then, of course, Ram It Down, 1988. You know, there's a little ponytail there, right? <laughs> what else we got here? Uh, this is the original uh, Judas Priest biography book, wow. which was published in uh, 1984, Heavy Duty, which came out to coincide with the, um, the Defenders of the Faith tour and album. That's what went for like rock biographies back then. Remember that old yeah. Sabbath one, which I yes, have? Uh, from Chris, Chris Welch. Chris Welch. Yep. Yeah. yeah, this is, uh, I mean, you know, my my three favorite books as a kid was, was Heavy Duty, the, the Sabbath book, and uh, Running Free from uh, from Iron Maiden. I got uh, Sad Wing oh, shirt nice. here. Yeah, this is the autographed uh, version of um, Screaming for Vengeance. Can I help that tour shirt? Uh, what else? We love our shirts. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> Got a British Steel one too. I love that box. I should have just bought that. Okay, that's it for me on the shirts. What else you got there, Chris? Uh, I've got the uh, the Judas Priest box set, which was autographed by uh, Glenn Tipton, Rob Halford, and uh, Ian Hill. That's nice. It's got a couple a couple autographs on it. I've got the Defenders of the Faith uh, autographed somewhere over here. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, this is a Japanese-only uh, Judas Priest, Priest Live and Rare, which has a bunch of uh, B-sides. Uh, let's see. I don't know if you think any of these are... Yeah, what do we got here? So here's the, uh, the Ripper boot. Painkiller tour complete. This is pretty cool. Nicely done. Full show. That's yeah, that's worth showing. That's pretty cool. This is a uh, this is a Judas Priest uh, twelve inch for Love Bites, and uh, I always thought it was cool because it had a, a, a bite taken <laughs> taken out of the actual record, so I thought that was pretty neat. Yep. Um, gosh, what else? Uh, this is uh, a yeah. uh, Priest like a twelve inch. Promo? Yeah, for uh, for Take on the World. Not sure which country this is from. Hmm. It's got live versions of White Heat, Red Hot, and Starbreaker on uh, on the B side. Very That's nice. Kind of neat. Um, what else? That's it. Yeah, pretty some, much. Some books. Uh, you know, we got uh, got a couple of Martin Popoff books here. Heavy Metal Painkillers, well worth reading. And his most recent one, he's got a part two coming to this: The uh, Decade of Domination. If you're into reading all about Priest and specifically the Priest albums of the 70s, highly recommend that. Um, we might as well end this with our name and our top five Priest albums oh, each. Okay. Right? So, you got yours handy? If not, I'll do mine first. Sure. So far, my top five Priest albums, which I'm sure someone will tell me I'm wrong. But <laughs> as, as Pete likes to say, these are my personal uh, top no five. No right or wrong so here, No guys. right or wrong. Um, number five is uh, British Steel. Um, I just you know love love some of the songs on there. There's a couple the the two that are played out I could do without, but you know overall the other you know seven songs on there I think are just great. Uh, number four, I'm sure a lot of people pick this as number one, and some people will yell at me for not having it as number one. Uh, but Stained Class, um, you know with songs like Exciter and uh, Saints in Hell and Better by you, better than me. I, it's a great record, uh, and the the top three are were really tough. Uh, I've moved them around a couple times. I see that there's a lot of crossing off going on. But uh, number three and three and two, uh, I just uh, I went back and forth. Uh, but three I have as Defenders of the Faith, and two I have as uh, Screaming for Vengeance. I mean, it's just to me, it's such a one-two punch. Uh, great songwriting, great production. 
I mean, really, the, the epitome of, of true 80s heavy metal. True, yeah. Uh, those, those two records. And, um, you know, my all-time favorite Priest record uh, is Hellbent for Leather. Uh, you know, with the title track, Green Mount Alishi, um, Delivering the Goods, Running Wild. Uh, I just, it's such a great record. Um, in the K.K. Downing book, he, um, I forget what he, the exact quote, but it was something like, uh, he said, uh, I don't think we did, we ever did anything before or since that was as good. Wow. And I know Mar man himself. Martin Popoff, who's, who's written. Oh, uh, that's his favorite. Album. That is oh, his yeah. yeah. all-time favorite Judas Priest record. So uh, I guess I'm in good company. But yeah, that's my, that's my top. It's a good five. list. And, yeah. and, and mine's going to be a little different here. And that's, and there's nothing wrong with that. Well, right? Absolutely. So coming in at number five for me is Screaming for Vengeance. Okay. Um, coming in at number four is Hellbent for Leather. Coming in at number three is Sin After Sin. Number two is Sad Wings of Destiny, and my all-time favorite Judas Priest album, which I think I've said here on this channel numerous times, is Stained Class. So again, that triumvirate right. is right there for me. Yeah, I mean, it's a, you can't go wrong with any of them. They're all, as long as Pete doesn't have uh, Demolition and Nostradamus, it's a killer We're, we're good. Yeah, we're good, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah those, I mean, those are, those are great picks. They're all great records. And it, it was really tough. Uh, you know, I almost put Painkiller in there, and I mean, God, Sin After Sin and Sad Wings are great records. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it is... They have a lot of really strong albums. Yeah. Really. And, you know, and I also thought about some of the more recent ones, too, which I love a lot, you know. And I thought, well, do I cheat and say Unleashed in the East? But, you know... I, I thought about that, too, but I'm like, I'm not going to yeah, do that. not going to go there. Yeah, yeah exactly. That'd, but, be, that'd um, be too easy, right? Yeah. That'd be number one for all of us. So. But, uh, but, yeah, great, great, great list, great band, and uh, it was an absolute honor, like always, to be here with Pete. And, and do one of these videos. Thanks, my friend. Uh, Chris so Allen here. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this mammoth uh, two-part edition of History Of. Uh, today we looked at uh, one of the greatest metal bands of all time, Judas Priest. But don't go away, because we've got on a separate show coming up, we're going to run down our top ten favorite Judas Priest songs. That's coming up next, so stay tuned. Be good.